Today, two, two topics from the textbook. One is the difference between uh, deductive and inductive arguments, and we're introducing this for the first time, so we're not going to go into great detail on this. If you've read ahead in Chapter 2, you notice that it, it treats deductive and inductive arguments again, and uh, this is a very important classification. Um, there are other kinds of arguments, but for the purposes of this class, we, we just classify them in these two groups, deductive and inductive. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we have uh, what we call indicator words, uh, premise and conclusion indicator words. And you notice that your book gives you a partial listing of those. We'll talk about how they work. Um, some of them you do have to be a little careful with, like the word because. Remember last class session, what else can because indicate besides an argument? Might be part of, starts with an E. Another kind of thing that's not an argument. Ex, uh, I almost said exclamation. Explanation, <laughs> yes. Uh, so because, you know, that, that one can be a little bit tricky. There's a few other ones that are a little bit tricky as well. Um, we're going to go over those. And I am going to put that list of premise and conclusion indicator words as well as um, others that you might find useful into Blackboard for you as a resource. So you, you want to start paying attention to those words when you're seeing them come to life. Um, but I'll get back to that in a moment. So with arguments, if we actually do have an argument, they come in two basic types, deductive and inductive. And once again, let me put this uh, schema back up. And actually, a little bit of, let's do a little bit of review. So what does the argument consist of? There, there's one sort of building block of arguments. Premises are, are one type of this thing. More basic than even premise. Conclusions are also these. Claims. Claims, very good. So we have claims up on top. And we call those premises. premises, right? And then we have a claim down on the bottom. And we call that the conclusion. And um, from now on in the, in the class, I'm going to um, just use premises and conclusions. I'm not going to write claims each time. Because now we've gone through this a number of times. So I, so I assume that by now it's sticking in your head that these are claims. That means they have to be statements indicating that something or asserting something is the case or is not the case. So they can't be questions, they can't be commands, they can't be exclamations, although remember you can turn those into claims. Um, maybe I should actually make a, a, a practice exercise for turning um, questions and, and uh, things into the claims. Do you think you'd find that helpful if I did that? Okay, I'll, I'll see about doing that this weekend. Okay, so I said last time that this arrow here, we could also give that a name too. And in the theory of argumentation, that's usually called inference. Now, what determines whether a argument is deductive or inductive has to do with that arrow. How are the premises connected to the conclusion? The arrow, um, this is you know, just sort of commonsensical um, basic, everybody can sort of figure it out, um, iconography, meaning, you know, graphs and things like that. Um, the arrow means that this leads to this, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, how does it? Don't worry about whether it actually does at this point. People get hung up on that. We'll worry about how to tell whether the premises actually do lead to the conclusion. Today, what you want to carry forward and into the chapter two, where we're going to discuss this, is this question, just how strong is this arrow supposed to be in the, for the person who's making the argument? If you have a deductive argument, what a deductive argument is saying is if the premises are true, that conclusion has to be true. It must be true. It's necessarily true. So once you grant those premises, the conclusion has to follow. Uh, the inductive argument doesn't say that. 
An inductive argument is a bit weaker. It says, if those premises are true, the conclusion is probably true, or is likely true, or has a good chance of being true. Um, let's, let's think of some examples. Here's a, an old classic, um, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, what do you think the conclusion is? What would you conclude from those two sentences? He's going to die, yeah, that's what moral means. So what you're doing there is you're coming up with a new claim. Socrates is moral, which uh, you guys know because uh, in the, um, the dialogue that I'm having you read, the credo, he's about to die, isn't he? Um, you're not actually reading the one where he does die, though, the phaedo. Um, that one actually includes, this is sort of a side note, but then you might find it interesting. That one actually includes a scene where he dies. He drinks the poison, and it's uh, the kind that um, must be what, what we nowadays call a nerve agent. You know, it starts uh, shutting your body down, and eventually you uh, suffocate, or you know, you know, other things that happen. Um, so Socrates is mortal. Now notice. These things are connected in such a way that if these premises are true, that's got to be that's got to be true. It might not be the case that those premises are true. It could be Socrates is an angel, right? Or Socrates is a stone. We wouldn't say stones are mortal because can stones die? I don't think so. Um, this might not be true. Maybe not all men are mortal. Maybe there's some people who live forever. I don't know. Um, but if we assume that these are true, that conclusion has to follow, doesn't it? So this is a good example of a deductive argument. Um, there's a lot of bad arguments that are deductive arguments, too. Uh, I'll, I'll put an example of that in a moment. Um, but right now I want to stick with good arguments so that you don't get you know, too confused. You have a good paradigm. <coughs> um, let's keep using Socrates. Um, Last, the, the, the class where I introduced him to you, uh, we started looking at the Credo. I asked you what you knew about Plato, and a few people knew a few things. Um, what do you know about this guy Socrates now? Just any sort of random fact. And then we'll make an argument out of it. Anything you remember. He was in jail. Okay. So... Socrates is in jail. Um, now, what's something you can say is probably the case about people in jail? Not necessarily the case, but... Okay, so people in jail. Let's not use probably in this case. Let's use another word that we often substitute for it. Usually have broken... Law. Therefore, what can we conclude here? Socrates Yeah, and and we can say like that. Socrates broke the law. Um, we could also add words like probably, most likely. But that's inductive, right? It is inductive, and the reason that it's inductive is because the connection between these premises and the conclusion is not absolute. It's likely. Probably. Um, some people in, in prison or in jail didn't break the law, right? There are, there are some innocent people in, in, in uh, jail. Although the, the percentage, at least in our country, I can tell you from having worked in a maximum security prison for, for six years and talked with a lot of inmates, there's a lot of people who, when they're talking with reporters and judges and, and outside people, you know, assert their innocence. And then when you talk to them one to one, to one and you get to know them for a while, they say, oh, yeah, I did it. You know. Um, and it's interesting. Almost none of them believe that any of the other people in the prison with them were framed 
or in the wrong place at the wrong time. When it comes to the guy next to them, they don't believe his story, um, which is kind of funny. So Socrates is in jail. People in jail usually, not always, usually are guilty of some crime. Therefore, Socrates is guilty of some crime. You're not asserting that as if you absolutely are 100% sure, are you? If you included that word likely. So if somebody wants to call you on and say, yeah, but aren't there some innocent people in prison? You could actually say, I didn't say that everybody in prison was guilty. I was making, you could say, I was making an inductive argument. I was making an argument about probabilities. Now, if you, let's take this one over here and let's change this one. Um, Socrates is in jail. And if we say something like, everybody in jail is guilty, Socrates is guilty, right? We have a deductive argument, because if these premises are true, that conclusion has to be true. It's not the case, though, is it, that these premises are both true? Socrates is in jail, that's true, right, in the, when you're reading the Credo. Um, is everybody in jail guilty? And we can think of at least, you know, uh, several cases where somebody has been put in jail and they, they weren't guilty. Um, I guess actually, you know, if we want to be really technical about this, <clears throat> using our justice system, we would, we would have to say Socrates is in prison, wouldn't we? Because he's, he's, um, he's sentenced already, and he's going to die. And we don't kill people in jails. People kill people in jails, but, but the state doesn't kill people in jails. We, we kill people in, in prisons. But question, if it's supposed to be true and we know it's not true, how can it still be the deductive argument? Because whether it's deductive or not, yeah, whether, remember, it's this thing right here that counts, whether it's deductive or inductive. It doesn't matter whether the premises are actually true at this point. For the kind of argument that it is, um, if, you know, if it's got this structure, if the premises are true, which they're not, the conclusion would have to be true. It's kind of hypothetical. It's a deductive argument. We can also have uh, bad arguments for inductive. So as long as it's saying something is certain, it's a deductive argument. Yeah, so long as it's saying that, so long as it's saying that uh, given those premises, the conclusion is certain. Okay. Then it's a deductive argument. Yeah. So is the key word in deductive argument everybody and the key word in inductive argument is usually? That's a good question. That's a key word. Uh, in these two arguments, that's the key word. There are a number of different key words that, that give it away to you. Just like when we're going to talk about premise and conclusion indicators, your book doesn't talk about this, but there are indicator words for telling whether you're dealing with a deductive or an inductive argument. I'm going to put those in Blackboard for you as well. As a matter of fact, I have them on a handout, some of them on a handout for you uh, under deductive and inductive arguments in Chapter 1, 2 material. Words like must. You know, the, that this must be the case, um, or absolutely, or necessarily, always, or never, right? If you're, if you're talking about never. And with the premises, if the word always is in there, or um, must, or what else, all, none, there you're probably looking at a deductive argument, uh, because they're including entire classes, they're, they're ruling out. Uh, possibility that things could be different. One other thing to think about deductive arguments, deductive arguments, if there's one exception to it, the whole argument fails. So if you want to show that this argument doesn't, isn't actually true, uh, isn't actually valid, I'm sorry, uh, we don't want to mix up truth and validity, um, or that it's not sound, you just have to show that there's one exception to it. Just find one innocent person in prison, and then the argument fails. Um, now, with an inductive argument, if somebody wants to point out exceptions, that's okay, so long as there are not too many exceptions. But let me give you an example of a, a bad inductive argument 
where the premises aren't actually true. Um, let's see. Uh, who should we pick on now? Let's, let's not use Socrates. Let's use somebody else. Uh, who's been in the news lately? Anybody? What's that? The president. Okay, so Barack. Bob, I'm going to abbreviate so that we don't take up too much blackboard. Um, let's see, Barack Obama, um, well, he's president. He's president. And most presidents go mad with power. Therefore, Barack Obama is um, man. man of power. <laughs> now, there have been a few presidents that have gone man with power. Uh, you know, perhaps we could we could make a case. Richard Nixon, you know, he uh, almost got himself impeached because he uh, broke the law. And uh, then concealed breaking the law, and, and uh, you know, if you if you actually look at the guy, he he was pretty power hungry and pretty power drunk. Um, maybe there were a few others, um, but most don't fit that profile. So that would be a false premise, wouldn't it? So this is not a good argument. It's not an argument that fails because. Um, you know, of the form of the argument, if these premises were actually true, that conclusion would probably be true. You know, think about other cases that you could compare it to. Um, what's something you can say about most students? That is true. Not come to class on time. Really? Most of them have a goal. What's that? They have a goal. Most students have a goal. Good. Yeah, and some students cl clearly don't. And those are often the ones that don't come to class on time, right? Um, having a goal and, and coming to class on time seem to be connected in some way. Um, oh, remember I, I, I've said several times that 8 o'clock classes, for some reason, tend to attract the kind of students who do better. I think there's something in the getting out of bed and getting yourself here on time and making sure that you're here that tends to separate 8 o'clock, students who, who do 8 o'clock classes from students who say are in the afternoon classes. Um, so, most students who go to 8 o'clock classes are, are driven, goal-centered, um, and uh, you are a student in an 8 o'clock class, you are probably goal-centered you know, and driven. That's an inductive argument. <clears throat> Could be wrong, couldn't it? Could be that you're just showing up at the eight o'clock class because your your roommate who really cares about you is, is poking you with you know with a stick in the morning and saying get out of bed you, you know and, and uh, making throwing you in the shower you know has your clothes laid out for you uh, your books laid out and says get over there you know that then hounds you until you actually get here it could be that that, that you know that could happen but that's not likely is it. So that would be an inductive argument. You know, there can be exceptions. Um, let's, let me give you a few other examples too. You can have a, you can have a bad deductive argument where it's not just the, whether the premises are true or not, it's that the premises don't actually lead to the conclusion, but they're being presented as if they do lead to the conclusion. So, let me take one from politics that comes up all the time. This is what we call the guilt by association uh, trick. Um, who would you like to, to target? Any group you want. Just pick some group. How about college professors? Okay. Uh, college, we'll let's say all. All. College professors diligently. No, I know this isn't true, but let's just assume it is, okay? Diligently.
study their research. Right? Again, yeah, that's not true. You do have a few professors here and there who don't know what they're talking about and somehow got through grad school. And, you know, but most of them do, right? Um, who else dil diligently studies the things that they're researching? You know who does? Terrorists. <laughs> All terrorists diligently study. Therefore, you know what? Exactly. Now, this is being presented as if the, the premises do, in fact, lead to that conclusion. And there's no, you know, qualifying words like most likely or could or, you know, probably. It's being presented as if this is a good deductive argument. It just turns out it's not, in part because of the way it's, it's set up, the way it's structured. Um, just because two groups overlap or belong to another group doesn't mean that those two groups are identical. That's the problem with that one. But people make arguments like this all the time, don't they? You know, um, they do it often with individuals. So and so. Um, yeah, stereotyping um, often involves deductive arguments. Well, let's let's do an example of that. In that case, it's usually. Um, the stereotyping is usually drawing on false premises. So, for example, uh, who do you want to pick on? Any group you want. Okay. Uh, we'll pick a guy. We'll call him. Uh, we'll call him Frank because I. Uh, Frank is a. Uh, I actually have a friend, uh, Frank Teller, who I went to college with, um, grew up on the reservation, and uh, we used to go and visit uh, his, his place. Now he's got a really long, almost unpronounceable Native American name that I have a very hard time remembering. Um, nice guy. So, Menominee's. Are Native Americans now? Here we need the, the the stereotype. What do you want to say about Native Americans? What's it? Okay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Frank is an alcoholic. Um, he's he's a, a a reformed alcoholic. He was the guy when I was in college that was the designated driver because um, he you know he he couldn't drink because he was an alcoholic. Um, I don't know that it had anything to do with being Native American. He he like I was a, a veteran. And we, we both picked up some pretty nasty habits in the army. Um, okay, so now these Native Americans. Native Americans, let's say all. All Native Americans are alcoholics. Therefore, Frank uh, is an alcoholic. Can I spell it? Yeah. That's one of those words that's easy to misspell, isn't it? Alcohol. Um, now, notice, actually, the, the conclusion is true in this case. But something went wrong along the way. Because these premises, um, in, in, in point of fact, don't actually lead to that conclusion. If, if you were to say this, you would, in fact, be correct. But you would not have had good reasons to think that you're correct. Um, this is true. Frank is a Menominee. He's full blood. Um, Menominees are Native Americans. Uh, they're, the, they're one of the dominant tribes in the state that I come from, Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, they're also a uh, large Menominee population in Chicago. That's how my, my family got connected with them, because the French and the Menominee intermarried. Um, all Native Americans are alcoholics. Um, there's the problem, right? There's where the stereotype comes in. Now, if you have in your mind a whole bunch of things kicking around like this, all or most or all that, and you don't actually have good reason to have those beliefs, 
Uh, and we'll talk about why people form those sort of beliefs later on in the semester. Then you are going to draw erroneous conclusions. Conclusions that you don't have good warrant to, to buy into. And this is one way stereotyping works. Um, and you can do this with any group you want. You can do it with college professors. You can do it with women. You can do it with um, people who have uh, long hair, short hair, things in their hair, uh, people listening to a particular kind of music, anything you like, any group, you can pick out and use words like all, none, and you can also do it with inductive arguments, most. Like, you know, if we wanted to weaken this, let's say somebody said, yeah, but it's not the case that, that all Native Americans are alcoholics. Then you might backpedal a little bit and say, well, you know, I don't mean all of them. I just mean most of them. There's a few good ones. You, you've all heard this in stereotyping, right? You know, there's a few good ones, but the, the majority, what's going on there is the person is making an inductive argument. Um, and here's the, what's kind of nice about this. If you learn how to analyze arguments, when you hear that sort of thing, you can break it down. And you can show the person if they actually want to listen to you. Quite often when people are prejudiced, do they want to listen? No. They're convinced and, and they want to live in their, their own very you know, small world. Um, but if they're actually amenable to listening, you could show them, here's where you're going wrong. Here's where you've made the mistake. And I'll tell you something too. This is something that I think um, no matter what field you're going into, you want to bring with you. If you don't know this lesson already, when you give somebody bad news like, you're wrong, how do people react when you say, you're wrong? Thank you. <clears throat> they get angry, right. And you know why? You know, where does anger come from? Because their feelings are hurt. Even tough guys. Everybody's got feelings. And uh, when you tell somebody that they're wrong, you are in some way throwing something in their face and they don't like that. And they get, they get angry and then the response is usually to push it away and say, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, now, if you can tell the person, well, you know, you're right about this, and you're right about this, and you know what, this is even a true conclusion, but your reasoning has one flaw in it. How does that sound compared to, you're full of crap, you don't know what you're talking about, or you're just wrong. Which sounds better to you? The... This is right, and this is right, and this is even correct. You just have one little problem here. If you can approach people like that, you will find doors will open, <coughs> conflicts will disappear, and you'll actually you know, attain what, what goals that you have. Um, it'll help you out a lot in life to be able to analyze arguments, to be able to tell people where, in fact, they're wrong. Also, you know, if your, your reasoning is going to be wrong sometimes, too. And you can be a lot easier on yourself. Um, and the world's going to be hard on you anyway, so you don't have to be super hard on yourself, do you? Um, you don't have to beat yourself up for having totally incorrect arguments. You can say, here's that one place where I was wrong. Then you can, you can start on uh, fixing it. Um, let's go now to another topic. And we'll come back to deductive and inductive really briefly at the end of the class. So, next topic is indicator words. The way our languages work, and every language works like this, whether it's French, German, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, um, they all have certain words that indicate a connection between thoughts, right? For instance, the word and. What does the and tell you? It's a bridge. It's right. It connects those together. Um, some of you who are old enough may remember that schoolhouse rock, uh, conjunction, junction, what's your function, one of those songs that gets stuck in your head, and once you get it in your head, you can't get it out for a while. Um, well, what is the function? Hooking up words and phrases and paragraphs. You know, see how quickly it comes back? Um, there are certain conjunctions that we use to indicate the connections between 
premises and conclusions. So your book gives you um, some examples. It follows that. Right? Let's do premises and conclusions. So if you say it follows that, what are you picking out? A conclusion or a premise? Or maybe both? Neither? What are you picking out? Conclusion. Conclusion, right. So if you say it follows that, you're saying, look, this phrase, this, um, this sentence, this statement follows from the ones that I've just given you. So um, let's say we take the uh, teachers and terrorists thing, you know. Uh, all, all FSU professors are diligent uh, at their job. Terrorists are also diligent at their job. It follows that FSU professors are, are all terrorists. Uh, bad argument. But you, you notice how that it follows that works. It connects things together. Uh, how about the word because? Is that a premise or a conclusion indicator? I would say a premise. Very good. Um, we usually use because when we give the conclusion first, and then we say because. Um, or, you know, you might say because so and so, blah, 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 I have reason to believe um, that. Yeah, that would be a, a way we'd use it. How about um, thus? Yes. And there's a couple words that are synonymous with thus. Thus, therefore, what's that? However. However is, is not a premise or conclusion indicator. Um, however could like be, but, right? yeah, but is not either. Because, like, however, like, but, like, say again? It's a connecting word, but it's not a, or a yeah, not all not all connecting words are indicating a premise or a conclusion. However, um, what it does is it sort of stops you and says, "I'm going to change where this is going." So does "but," right? Yeah. Those are similar that way. What are some other words that are like that? Um, yet, um, still, those are not uh, premise or conclusion indicator words because they're not actually picking out here. This is this is the the. A supportive material, here's the point that we're... What about as if? As if, no, I don't think that, I don't think that would be a... Let me think if I can, as if, how would that be used for either? I, I don't think so. Um, so, thus, therefore, so. Um, this one you want to be careful with, so. Because so is used as a conclusion indicator, but how else do we use so? Can you think of any other ways? To say that something's true or something. That something is so, yeah. Uh, that, that's a, a way I hadn't even thought of. Usually we use it uh, in a what we call comparative way. That is so um, stupid. That is so great. It's, it's as great as, or it's very great. That's not indicating a conclusion. That, that's a different use of, of so. Remember, too, with because, you got to be careful with that one, too, because that might indicate that we're talking about an um, explanation, not, not necessarily a, an argument. Um, how about given? Yeah, given or since what these are saying is that if you accept this, then something else is going to uh, come from it, right? So those are premise indicators. Uh, your book also gives you in view of, that's very similar to that, isn't it? <clears throat> Anything that's telling you, it, or if you spell it out directly, if you assume that, given the case that. Um, you're talking about a premise indicator. Uh, let's look at a few other conclusion indicators. Um, 
he has in here, my conclusion is, well, that one gives it away, right? So we don't even have to put that one on the board. Uh, hence, this is what a lot of people don't know how to use all that well, and they might actually use it to indicate a, a premise, <coughs> but really it in indicates a conclusion. It says, here's where we're going, hence. Um, uh, consequently, Um, or this implies that, uh, consequently, comes from a Latin word, um, sequor, and guess what that one actually means? It's, it's, it's similar to something that's in here. Or it actually be sequiri would be the, the infinitive. Uh, it means to follow. So if you say that something is consequent to something else, it means that it's following it, right? Um, unfortunately, we don't, you know, it used to be in the old days that, that, that if you went to school, and school was pretty restrictive back then, you probably learned a smattering of Greek and Latin. That really helps you out when you're learning English, um, knowing Greek and Latin. Um, we don't do it anymore, unfortunately. But... Uh, yeah, a lot of our, a lot of the meanings of our words, if you know the, the Greek Latin roots, you can figure out how they're connected with each other. Yes. Unfortunately, following. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't necessarily indicate a, a premise um, or a conclusion. I think it, you could actually use it for, you could use it for both of them, but it doesn't necessarily indicate that. Like you could, you could um, say a number of premises. Well, let's take the the stereotyping Native American one with, with poor Frank. Um, Frank is Menominee. Uh, Menominees are Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans tend to be alcoholics. Unfortunately, Frank is an alcoholic, right? What we're doing with that, we're not actually using it to indicate a, a premise. We're, we're using it to indicate how we feel about it or how we want the reader or the hearer to, to feel about it. Yeah, and I guess with stereotyping, this would be a way to sort of soften the stereotyping and um, in some ways make it a little bit more insidious, wouldn't it? Um, you know how it might be used in, in terms of premises? You, you could say something like, um, here would be an example. All of you would like a day off. True premise? Okay. Um, we have a day off when it snows. Another true premise? More, more or less, right? Um, unfortunately, it's not supposed to snow anytime soon. What's your conclusion? You're not going to have any days off. <laughs> which, which could be wrong, of course, right? Because you might have days off for other reasons. But you notice how I use unfortunately there. It's being used as a transition, and it's being used of a premise, but it's not a premise indicator word. It's, it's doing the same sort of thing that, that um, but, or what was the word that, that you used uh, that I said was similar to but, however, right? It's doing the same sort of thing. It's, it's slightly changing the direction of the, the argument. But it's not an indicating premise or now, the one thing I want to say before we, we close, to come back to the first thing that we started talking about, deductive, inductive arguments. There aren't just indicator words for premises and conclusions. There are also indicator words for deductive and inductive arguments. Um, if you have an argument and the conclusion says, it therefore must be the case that you are dealing with a uh, deductive argument, and that indicator word, must, is telling you that. If you see words in the conclusion like, well, it's probably the case, or it's likely the case, or this gives us fairly good reason to believe, those are indicator words that are telling you, I'm looking at an inductive argument. You won't always have indicator words. So sometimes you have to exercise common sense. You know, you, you have to uh, be able to figure out on your own what is a premise and what's a conclusion. But these indicator words can be... Um, shortcuts for you, you know, and, and you want to use them well too in your own writing. I guess the last thing I'll say too is, is one caution. 
all of you know somebody who, who uses the English language and does not know what the words that they're saying mean, right? Who has a larger vocabulary than their, their <coughs> comprehension of the vocabulary. All the stuff that I'm saying um, goes out the window with those people because they may in fact use because to indicate a conclusion, right? right? And there's nothing you can do about that. They just, they just don't understand the way the language and its logic works. So, I mean, you can correct them if you want. <laughs> if, they're, hey, if, they're, if you're responsible for them, I suppose you should. But otherwise, you know, this stuff you can't apply that. Ninety-nine percent of the people you come across, you will be able to apply this to their arguments. So, have a good weekend, and I'll see all of you on Monday. Um,